Well, hi, church, and welcome again to our midweek look in the book. And we've been, for the past six weeks, studying the attributes of God, uh, centering our attention on that great quote of A.W. Tozer, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So we've been looking at the attributes of God, relating them to our daily lives. L let, me, let me just say, you know, there are certain things about God that are incomprehensible, beyond our understanding. You embrace a certain amount of mystery. But, but never let people use that as an excuse for not taking seriously the specific things that God has faithfully revealed about himself to us. There are things we can know about God. The reason the Bible tells us these things about God is so that we would be able to better place our trust in him, have confidence in him, know him. You can't love an object that you know nothing about at all. So, yes, God is certainly bigger than our understanding, but he has chosen to make some things very clear about himself and expects the church to learn those things and to treasure those things. So tonight, the omnipotence of God the infinite resources of our almighty heavenly father. Text I want to open with is Revelation 19.6. Get a Bible. We're just going to have a quick study on this subject tonight. The omnipotence of God. Revelation 19.6. John says, And then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Great words, these. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. God reigns because he's almighty. That almighty means there are no threats to his reign. You look around you, the things that go on in the world, you watch the news, it could be so troubling. Things are confusing and difficult. There are no threats to the reign of God because he is almighty. That means there is nothing in all of creation or beyond that can end his reign or compete with his reign. It's not like we mortals. I mean, we encounter so much opposition against the power of our own beings. We get old, we get sick, we get weak, we have limitations. We, we, we are all, unless we're just naive, we're all aware of so many things that are more powerful than we are. Things that are bigger than we are. Now, that, the text says, that is something God never experiences. Nothing bigger, nothing stronger, nothing that can compete. The word omnipotent, that's the word theologians use to describe the limitless power of God. And actually, it does occur once in the old King James Version in our opening text. Let me read it to you. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, omnipotent, reigneth. So that word omnipotent comes from uh, Latin roots, meaning having all power. The Anglo-Saxon word we use more commonly is almighty, and that occurs 56 times in the Bible to make a point. Here's the, here's the significant thing about that. That word almighty in all 56 occasions is never used to describe anything or anyone but our Father God. It's never used to describe angels or demons or principalities, never any other powers, not the devil himself. I know he's called the ruler of this world, but that's a, that's a, uh, uh, a concession, a delegated authority. He's not almighty. So in marvelous contrast to all of that, this, this one being, this one being alone 
is starkly almighty. And that's why the, 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 the central conviction of the scriptures is, is summed up by the psalmist. Look at Psalm 6211. Psalm 6211. The writer says, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that, that power belongs, underline belongs to God. Other beings have power, but power belongs to God. Other beings have power, but that power doesn't belong to them. It's granted to them. It's given to them. Everything else that has any degree of power depends on God for that power. Power, the psalmist says, belongs to God in a way that it just doesn't belong to anyone else or anything else. And the, and the Bible just keeps reinforcing this truth. Apparently, we need it desperately, and it's, it's repeated over and over again. Creation itself only holds together because of God's sustaining power. Colossians 1, 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Great words, these. Great words, these. The overworked adjective, awesome. Everything's awesome. But it, but it truly does apply to our omnipotent God. The seasons, the winds, the movements of the planets, the life in the soil, the power of the atom. Everything would lie silent and cold if God didn't sustain everything. Through Christ, God sustains everything by the word of his power. Truly, Power belongs to God. Now, one of the problems is we live in a world where it's very easy, just with the, the, our terminology, to uh, ignore or um, cover up the omnipotent power of God. We, we consider the way we talk about laws of nature, for example. Now, now, Creation is a better term than nature, for starters. But, but even that word law, it can be used in, in two different ways. There's, there's a law against robbing banks. It exists in law books. The law is uh, an external code, and it's enforced by some authority. Then there are also what we sometimes loosely describe as laws of nature, but we only call them laws because they seem to happen so consistently, regularly, over and over again. What we observe happening regularly around us, the laws of nature, these are simply the footprint, the path of our almighty God in his creation. And he works so faithfully and consistently that we just call them laws of nature. But what you really have there are these manifestations of an almighty creator God. All we do is record them. All we do is observe them. We don't create those things. You don't create the law of gravity. Look at Psalm 33, 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Or, or look at Psalm 89, 11, and 12. The heavens are yours. The earth also, it's yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you created them. I mean, why does the Bible put such an emphasis on this seemingly obvious truth? And it's this. The, the danger of our secular age is we get so absorbed in God's footprints in his creations that we forget about the one who created those footprints in the first place. Where the saints of scripture, they, they lived in a world where everything pointed to an almighty activity of a God of love and justice and sometimes wrath. We can explain it away, cover it up. And, and the problem with all of this, is it gets harder and harder, even for, even for godly people, to keep thoughts of their creator close to the front of their daily thinking. We need to be, we need to be uh, 
increasingly intentional in the way we use words. I don't like talking about nature, mother nature, laws of nature, nature. I like to talk about creation because it, it, it traces my mind automatically back to a creator in the way nature doesn't. I want to make four statements. I'm just going to do one of them tonight because we've had kind of a long introduction. I want to make four statements about the omnipotence of God. We'll do one tonight. We'll do three next week. Four statements about the omnipotence of God, and each statement will begin with these words, because our God is almighty, all right? So here, point number one. Because God is almighty, he is able to do what he says he will do. Look at Psalm 115, verse 3. Psalm 115, verse 3, and it makes this very clear with this statement. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He does all that he pleases. We should be grateful every once in a while for such a short sentence that sums up so much. And this is one of them. How do you know who God is? Well, you'll know when you see him because he's the one who does whatever he pleases. Actually, the Apostle Paul significantly uh, repeats the same idea in more Christological terms in the New Testament. It's in Ephesians 1, 11. Remember, our God does whatever he pleases. Here's how Paul words it. Ephesians 1, 11. In him, Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, that's Father God, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He does whatever he pleases, the psalmist. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. People get so hung up arguing about Calvinistic versus more Arminian or Wesleyan uh, interpretations of the doctrine of predestination that they actually miss uh, the last part of this terrific verse where, where Paul says you can identify God Almighty like, like he does all things according to the counsel of his will. Here's how you identify God. You know how it works. You're, you're at a party. You're at a gathering. You see someone you don't know. Somebody starts to tell you, oh, you know him. That's Jerry. He's the guy who, and then they tell you something about him. And you go, oh, yeah, that's who that is. That's what Paul is doing here. He's talking about God, not just some vague ancestral spirit, one of many gods and legends built about gods. This is a factual revelation about God. He says something about who God is. About halfway through the verse, he says, who, who, how do you know who he is? He works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's who God is. He does whatever he pleases, the psalmist says. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. You can't say those words about anyone else. No matter how big, no matter how powerful a person may get, only God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Only God does whatever he pleases. That means your life is always safe in his hands. It's, it's important to remember when you look at these attributes, you have to hold them all together. The, the omnipotence of God and how it pairs so beautifully with the last two weeks we've been studying the wisdom of God. Wisdom means God can always be trusted to do what's best. It doesn't mean I will always have a full understanding of his ways. But divine wisdom an all-wise God. It means he can always be trusted in everything he does, and his omnipotence means he is always able to accomplish his best ends. No one can thwart his reign. Hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty truly reigns. Never forget it, you're always safe in his hand. Let's pray. We do thank you, Lord Jesus, for the revelation that we have 
You uphold all things by the word of your power. Our Father God is almighty, omnipotent, all wise and omnipotent. And I pray that you'll help us to not, uh, not have a God that's too small, but that our thoughts would grow and expand in the hymn writer would say we'd be lost in wonder, love, and praise. The joy, the joy of trusting in an almighty God. Bless this truth to our hearts. Help us to remember it all week long, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, Sunday morning here at the church, Sunday night online. Let's stay in the word together. God bless the church. Love one another.